All right, hi, well, we'll get started. Ooh, that's louder, awesome. Uh, I'm David McNamee with LingoTech. Please stop by Booth 21 if you wanna learn more about localization. Um, that's what we do. Uh, we have been a part of the Drupal community since 2007. So we've had a little experience solving some of the challenges on the technical side. This today is not going to be a technical discussion. I hope everybody read the summary and no one's totally disappointed by that. Okay. Um, we are going to tackle one of the questions that I get a lot, which is, well, how can I justify providing multiple languages on our websites? Believe it or not, this is a question that gets asked a lot. So we'll look at some of the arguments. We're going to look at building an ROI, and then we'll kind of wrap up quickly with talking about prioritization. Uh, I've got a good solid 15 minutes to talk through something that I usually spend about two hours talking. So I can either talk really fast or we can focus on just a couple of things. So I wanna focus on defining the ROI, what some of the inputs are and where that comes from and some of the persuasive uh, arguments that we, we make uh, around adding languages to our websites. These are the greatest hits of why people tell me they're not going to add languages to their websites. This, this is a very common list. Price, it's too hard. Oh, it's too hard. Okay. We don't really get benefit from adding languages. Okay. Google Translate, we, Google Translate is there. Why do we have to add languages to our website? How many of you want to trust Google Translate or any other commercial? I mean, I'm not bashing Google. They do great work on if you pay. All right. Same thing with Deeple and Microsoft and Amazon, everybody else. There's a paid side to that story. And then the last one is my favorite. Everybody speaks fill in the blank. If you're in Madrid, everybody speaks Spanish. If you're in Washington, everybody speaks English. Right? It's not really the case. I've gotten to travel a lot and no, not everybody speaks one language. So that argument has to be destroyed very, very quickly. Flip it around. What are some really good reasons for adding languages? It's really hard to argue against these. Okay? Leave emotion out of it. Let's just talk about the practical commercial opportunities around servicing people who spend money. There's a lovely company called CSA Research. Uh, they're a language services uh, industry advocate. They have this great study that I've, I've referenced here. You'll be able to see it. Uh, in the slides post, but their research shows uh, consistently 40% of people who are shopping online will not buy if they can't do it in their own language. 40%, that's a really big number, and I'm bad with numbers. I know that's a big number. Okay? So we want to look at that. Along with that is entry into markets. What are your competitors doing? If you're trying to keep up to pace with the others in your industry, maybe it's an opportunity to get ahead of them if you can service underserved markets. Okay? Domestic opportunities. Now, I'm from the United States. Not that anybody could tell from my seven different accents you've heard already during this presentation. Thank you, sir. Servicing multiple languages in some place like that should be a no-brainer. It's not. We have to argue about it sometimes. So looking at second and third most spoken languages inside of an existing market is potentially huge because you don't have to learn new tax codes. You don't have to have new supply chains. You don't have to have a lot of the new things you need when you're entering a new market. You can just jump right in with some translations for a fairly low uh, barrier to entry. So there's some, some other things from the commercial side that we can definitely talk about. But usually when we're here, people are starting to pull out their spreadsheets and you know, scribble some numbers and, and do some things and make it a little, little, little more of an engaged conversation. You also have this weapon, legal obligations. Has ever, anyone ever heard of a small Canadian province called Quebec? <laughs> yes, yes, if you do business in Quebec, you are doing business in French. It's just gonna happen, okay? If you're not, 
they're making your life fairly difficult. Quebec is not unique around the world in enforcing official languages legislation. So you want to take a look at that and see what are you obliged to provide from a legal perspective when you enter a market. Then price goes out the window, right? It's no longer too expensive. You, you have to do it. And then social impact. And we talk about commercial, we talk about legal. But if you're a nonprofit organization, if you're a government entity, if you're an NGO, maybe revenue isn't your, your chief objective. So you have to look at the potential social impact that you're going to make. Language revitalization efforts are happening around the world. You know, people are, you know, in Wales, doing a great job trying to bring Welsh uh, back to life uh, and, and, and reinvigorate it. Uh, you can look at things that are happening, happening in Asia. People are realizing, hey, this is our cultural heritage. We want it to stay around. So does it benefit you to help with that? and to provide your information, your services, in one of these underserved communities, um, especially if you're an NGO. We just went through, you know, still, a significant event, and people had to learn how to say social distancing in languages that really don't, don't have that concept. So being able to reach those places um, and, and, and do that efficiently, effectively, land that message, very, very important. So if you're here, I'm going to assume you think it's a good idea to go ahead and add more languages to your site. So let's talk about justifying it with some numbers. Return on investment is not my favorite financial metric in the world. I will be very upfront with that. But it's useful because everyone who's got a business degree has a handle on it. So if you're talking to your managers, you're talking to your financial people, you're talking to your marketing people, they're going to have a fundamental grasp of ROI. It's trying to answer the question, is this a good investment? If I spend money on it, am I going to at least break even? Am I going to lose money on this? Okay. So we try to put this together and so, yeah, you'll be okay. Sometimes the answer is, no, this is a bad idea, run. Don't do it. It happens. Other times, you know, most of the time, we can make it look uh, like reasonably well. So I have a ri ridiculous example buried in here. Um, <laughs> the return on the investment is a ratio. It's, to, it's pre presented as a percentage. So we're taking how much gain, usually how much money are we going to make, subtracting the expense that we had getting there, and then dividing it by that expense. So we get a percentage. Okay? Um, if you get, you know, zero percent, you break even. Anything higher than that, you're making a little bit of money. Um, so, you know, I spend five thousand on a farm, sell it for seven thousand. That winds up being a forty percent ROI. Two thousand profit by five thousand expense. Basic math. Like I said, it's not perfect, and this this last bullet point is it. How do we agree what's a gain, what's a cost? You would be surprised the arguments that I've had in my life about what is actually allowed to be considered a cost. Different organizations have different rules. So you want to have this conversation with somebody in your team who understands that. You know, do we look at soft costs? Are those allowed? Right? Um, your sources for some of these numbers are going to come from a lot of places. So if you're serious about putting together an ROI, get ready to go into research mode. Because depending on the market that you want to service, the numbers might be a little more difficult to find. Your language demographics, most governments have some basic information. The language industry, uh, CSA Research I mentioned, Slater, there's a, there's a lot of great resources that have sort of these, these impact values and where are people speaking these different languages that you might want to support. Buying power, that's how we can say, hey, if you know, you're going to address a Spanish-speaking market in North America, this is the potential buying power of that entire market. And then you want to kind of understand your organization's market share. How much do they have? How much do they want to have? What's realistic over a certain amount of time? So with that, here's an example, okay? 
I do not expect anyone in the back to be able to read this. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a, a, a list of, or a, a spreadsheet that I did for a, a client, um, we'll call them a sports apparel company. Uh, $75 million annual revenue based off of the UN estimates. They're in the United States. Uh, we've got a 21,000 uh, billion, that's 21 trillion dollar uh, GDP. The market size for fashion apparel, for sports apparel, about 170 billion. We start doing some math. And then we take a look at that company's market share. So they have you know, less than 1% of the market share. And that's how we derive some of these numbers, is what do we expect them to be able to have if we carry that over into a different language market? So if you get 0.04% of the market in English, which is the core language that most US companies support, if you take that over to, say, Spanish, this first line, uh, we know, based off of the research that's been provided, there's a $190 uh, trillion, dollar, well, or, sorry, $1.9 trillion opportunity addressing that market. So if you multiply that out, you can say, eh, you probably get you know, two, uh, you know, $2 million out of that. What would you spend to get $2 million into your revenue? Well, if we're just talking about website translation, that's probably on the order of four to seven thousand dollars, depending on how many words you have. Seven thousand dollars to get two point seven million dollars sounds like a pretty good deal, right? So, based off all that that math, pull that out, and we look at Tagalog. Tagalog is a language that not everyone's heard about. Okay, very commonly spoken in the Philippines. Uh, we have a pretty sizable population in the United States. So if you think about the United States and adding languages to your website, you immediately think about Spanish. You're probably thinking pretty quickly about one of the flavors of Chinese language. Well, if we look at Tagalog, and just on these numbers, we're looking at a 1,700% ROI. We're going to get our money back and then some. So not a bad deal. Now, not realistic. It's, that's just some, some core numbers. The real argument is what goes into those costs. What can you really expect from a revenue perspective? So after you have some arguments, you may come back and say, well, sales and marketing thinks that we can capture 25% of that potential market. This is the internal argument that you're gonna have to have with people. It'll cost so much money in marketing and revenue, and maybe we have some software to help us out with that. See Lingo Tech with 31. Um, so we readjust the math, and maybe we call it a 9% ROI in year one, if we assume that we'll get 25% of the market straight off the bat. Not unreasonable for an underserved community to go that hard. So year one, we have a really good case that, yeah, it might be worth it to invest in the fourth most spoken language in our country, and maybe look at the other ones later. This is just food for thought. Okay? Like I said, ROI is not perfect. My biggest complaint is it doesn't account for time-based issues. Um, is anyone familiar with net present value? How much is my money worth today as opposed to tomorrow? Big important argument. The, 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 the financial people in your company will sit down and explain it all to you over three or four lunches if you let them. Um, your available budget. Um, Year one return is usually the worst but because we have startup costs. New business licensing, new fees if you're going into a new, uh, new market. Um, I like to look at multi-year forecasts because that's going to give us a better idea of and maybe years one and two are investment years, which means we have a negative ROI, which means we're losing money. But by year three, we're making that back. And by year four, we're profitable might be worthwhile depending on what business you're in, what kind of impact you're trying to have. But I also like to present return on investment alongside some other numbers. So if we have brand recognition scores, you know, what do people think of our brand? Do they know our brand? You see these advertisements on you know, Google all the time uh, or YouTube, right? Do you recognize this brand? Marginal sales benefit, social impact estimates. 
These are all recognized financial metrics that people will pay attention to. And if you present them along with a very simple uh, return on investment, uh, you can get some traction on adding languages to your site. So very quickly, prioritization. You take all of that and build a game plan. Figure out your inputs and your outputs. That's, that's basic you know, math, right? You waited in line to hear that. <laughs> get your inputs, get your outputs, and then figure it out. Okay? But the real argument is, do we agree on the inputs? Do we agree on the outputs? And then look at that. You know, are you going to be able to maybe go with a, another option? It might be surprise you. Your first choice may not be the best one. So we've got just about five minutes left in the session time. Uh, happy to open it up for questions and answers. Uh, and I don't know if we've had anything online. Probably not. Yep. Clear. I'm yours. Fire. Anything about ROI, anything about localization, translation industry, I'm happy to answer in the next few minutes. And again, if someone has to jet, thank you so much for your time. I hope this was helpful. And uh, we'll, we'll give you some new ideas that you can use to get as many languages on your websites as humanly possible. How many languages should you, should you translate into? My answer is all of them. That's not realistic, but yeah. And I think he's going to pass you a microphone, but we'll get you on there. Uh, so are there any particular factors to do with translations that you've found from experience have caught you out uh, from producing a model compared to what actually happened? Hmm. I haven't seen dramatic variation, but what usually happens is someone decides, oh, great, that's a lovely model. We've decided that we like it so much. Now you had to add these three other things to it uh, because you've convinced us so much around localization that we want to go hyper-localization. We not only want to have English, we want to make sure that you know, we're targeting our message for our friends in the UK. So we have American English and UK English. And then they realize Canadian English Oh, hey, that's a totally different thing, man, eh? So we may want to have some, so, so getting into the, some of those conversations is they want to overdo it, yeah. which, you know, I've got no problem. If you, want to, if, if you want to target that group specifically, it always helps to have some, some local flavor, especially if you've got a message that's emotional and you're trying to really motivate and convince people. So again, public health and safety. Oh, yeah, I want people to wash their hands really well. Well, if I'm going to do that and just say that, it might be okay in one market, but wouldn't it be you know, great if you could localize that for other markets that you're putting that into? Great question. So kind of a wishy-washy answer, but, but the answer is no. I haven't, I haven't seen this destroyed. Some people will kind of go, oh, that's ROI, that's very simple. I said, yeah, it is very simple. And we're acknowledging that it's very simple. But gee, don't you see there's a foundation to dig a little bit deeper? If I show you, you know, 20% ROI by year three, don't you want to talk about it a little bit more? Maybe this number goes down, but if we can keep that conversation going, we can, we can have good success. That's my objective. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Localization, translation, baseball trivia. What is baseball? All right, everybody, enjoy the rest of your conference. Uh, there's some other great localization sessions. I'm not doing it, but that's okay. Um, and uh, stop by the Lingotech uh, booth at booth 21. And please remember to fill in your conference and your presenter evaluations. Appreciate that. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And we will continue with localization uh, with D9 localization with the D9 localization server upgrade initiative um, in five minutes around. So yeah, thank you for being here.